Dear learners, this lecture will concentrate on Alfred Lord Tennyson's famous elegiac sequence in memoriam, pointing out the personal and universal traits in the elegy. Although there are only six poems prescribed for your study in the PG-1 syllabus, my effort here will be to briefly introduce to you all the important themes and strains present in the whole sequence. You must be aware that In Memoriam is a sequence of 131 poems, including a prologue and an epilogue, composed over a period of 17 long years and not originally intended for publication. It is therefore not one single expression of bereavement. It is the slow gathering of 17 years and bears with it all the varying moods which a long enduring sorrow would assume. The complete title of the elegy itself will help you to understand that it was written for a particular purpose. It is titled In Memoriam AHH, signifying that it was written in the memory of Tennyson's dear friend Arthur Henry Hallam. It is important and interesting to know the backdrop of this friendship which produced such pain and such poetry. A young Alfred Tennyson arrived at Cambridge University in 1827. He became fast friends with Arthur Henry Hallam, another student and a fellow poet. Both were aspiring poets and Arthur helped Alfred in his budding efforts, coming strongly in support of him when Tennyson's initial poems received scathing attacks from reviewers. Their families eventually came closer and in 1832, Arthur became engaged to Tennyson's sister, Emilia. However, the very next year, when Hallam was still in his early 30s, he suffered from a brain hemorrhage while on a continental trip. Tennyson was devastated and he vented his shattered emotions in verse, which he continued to augment until the result was finally published in 1850 as his long masterpiece. Tennyson was just 24 and the death dealt a great emotional blow to the young poet who spent the next 10 years writing over a hundred poems dedicated to Hallam. This lengthy work describes Tennyson's memories of the time he spent with Hallam in Cambridge, their days of their friendship and coming together as family members. I will quote a few lines from the poem where Tennyson is recollecting Hallam reading out his poems to his Cambridge companions. O oh, bliss when all in a circle drawn about him, heart and ear were fed, to hear him as he lay and read the Tuscan poets on the lawn. Tennyson grapples with the tremendous grief he feels after the loss of such a dear friend, concluding famously in one of the poems of In Memoriam, "'Tis better to have loved and lost than never to have loved at all." Hallam's death was more than a single or a personal event. It rather triggered a host of uncertainties within Tennyson's mind. He was overwhelmed with doubts about the meaning of life, existence, the significance of man's existence in this universe, about the nature of a god who was supposed to be benevolent, who could, however, snatch away a young life in its prime. In Memoriam is a personal elegy which talks about Tennyson's own past, but it is also a poem which reflects Tennyson's struggle with the Victorian's growing awareness of another kind of past. That is, the vast expanse of geological time and evolutionary history. The new discoveries in biology, geology, astronomy, medicine implied a view of humanity that much distressed many Victorians, including Tennyson. In a poem uh, called Maud, for example, Tennyson describes the stars as cold fires, yet with power to burn and brand his nothingness unto man. 
Unlike the Romantics, he possessed a painful awareness of the brutality and the indifference of nature read in tooth and claw. This is another important line which is taken from one of the evolutionary poems contained within In Memoriam. Although Tennyson associated evolution with progress, he also worried that the notion seemed to contradict the biblical story of creation and the long-held assumptions about man's place in the world. Nonetheless, In Memoriam insists that we must keep our faith despite the latest discoveries of science and he writes in the prologue to the poem, Strong Son of God, immortal love, whom we that have not seen thy face by faith and faith alone embrace, believe where we cannot prove. And at the end of the poem he concludes, that God's eternal plan includes purposive biological development. Thus, he reassures his Victorian readers that the new science does not mean the end of an old traditional faith. The problems confronted in, in memoriam, though forced upon Tennyson by the death of Hallam and by the spirit of his age, are neither local nor ephemeral. They are universal in that they are those which are apt to beset a sensitive intellectual mind in any age and at any time. Now, to understand in memoriam, it is very important to understand the structure of the poem. That is, if at all it can be called a structure. In memoriam consists of 131 smaller poems of varying length, which I have already mentioned, including a prologue and an epilogue. Each short poem is comprised of isometric stanzas. The stanzas are composed in iambic tetrameter, quatrains with the rhyme scheme ABBA, a form that has since become popular as the in memoriam stanza. Although Tennyson did not invent this form, he gave it the finesse and importance that it retains its name as the in memoriam stanza. With the ABBA rhyme scheme, the poem resolves itself in each quatrain. It cannot propel itself forward. Each stanza seems to be complete, closed and denote a kind of finality. Thus, to move on from one stanza to the other is a motion that, not, that does not come automatically to us, the readers, by virtue of the rhyme scheme. Rather, we must will it ourselves. This forced will seems to symbolize the poet's difficulty in moving on after the loss of his beloved friend Arthur Henry Hallam. For instance, if we look at sonnet number seven, especially considering the final line, this burdensome nature of existence, this inability to continue happily, spontaneously without the presence of a beloved is evident. I read out the last quatrain of uh, poem seven. He is not here but far away, the noise of life begins again, and ghastly through drizzling rain, on the ball street breaks the blank day. The last line cannot be read fast or smoothly, and this is a deliberate construction to suggest the burdensome nature of the life left to the poet, also highlighting the gloominess and the finality of death which cannot be changed in any way. T.S. Eliot called this poem, meaning in memoriam, the most unapproachable of all of Tennyson's poems and indeed, the sheer length of this work makes it difficult for the reader to study it in depth. Moreover, the poem contains no single unifying theme and its ideas do not unfold in a particular linear order. The narrative of 17 biographical years have been reduced to three fictional years. It is loosely organized around three Christmas sections, poem 28, 78 and 104, each of which marks another year that the poet must endure after the loss of Hallam, yet the moods slightly changing, beginning with the rawness of grief and gradually maturing to a kind of understanding and habitual existing of living without the departed. There is no organic unity and no linear progression from sorrow to joy here. Rather, there is a pendulum swing 
of mood fluctuations, wave-like movements of stasis and retreat, an almost diastolic and systolic pattern of the heart pumping blood. The climax of the poem is generally considered to be section 95, which is based on a mystical trance Tennyson had in which he communed with the departed spirit of Hallam late at night on the lawns of his home in Somersby. Now, the most important question which strikes the reader or the student when he's reading in memoriam is whether we consider in memoriam as a pastoral elegy or a digression from a pa pastoral elegy. In memoriam was intended as an elegy or a poem in memory and praise of one who has died. As such, it contains many of the elements of the pastoral elegy, such as Milton's Lycidas or Arnold's Thyrsus, including ceremonial mourning for the dead, praise of his virtues and consolation for his loss, use of pathetic fallacy which denotes nature mourning the death of the departed. Moreover, all statements by the speaker can be understood as personal statements by the poet himself. Like most elegies, in memoriam, begins with expressions of sorrow and grief, followed by the poet's recollections of a happy past spent with the individual he is now mourning. These fond recollections lead the poet to question the powers in the universe that could allow a good person to die in the prime of his youth, which gives way to more general reflections on the meaning of life and the existence of humanity in this universe. Eventually, the poet's attitude shifts from grief to resignation. Finally, in the climax, he realizes that his friend is not lost forever, but survives in another, higher form. The poem closes with a celebration of this transcendental survival. In memoriam ends with an epithalamion, or a wedding poem celebrating the marriage of Ten Tennyson's sister Cecilia with Lord Lushington in 1842. The poet suggests that their marriage will lead to the birth of a child who will serve as a closer link between Tennyson's generation and the crowning race because Tennyson had come to believe that if evolution is something to be accepted and not the depiction of creation as contained in the Bible, then evolution also entails within it the movement of mankind from a baser state to a higher form, of which he believed that Hallam would be a kind of symbol or a forerunner. This birth also represents new life after the death of Hallam and hints at a greater cosmic purpose, which Tennyson vaguely describes as a line from the poem, one far off divine event to which the whole creation moves. However, the poem is not a typical pastoral elegy where traditionally there is no surety about the personal intimacy between the poet and the departed. It is unique in its personal touch where Tennyson rejects the pastoral tradition in its elaborate pretense and the artistic device of a pastoral setting it's with its artificiality where the bereaved and the dead both are shepherds. The other important and vital segment of the in memoriam sequence is the presence of evolutionary ideas. Because if we try to understand in memoriam as a poem, we also have to understand that Tennyson's loss is not just a personal loss of losing one's friend who is extremely beloved, but he is also signifying another kind of loss that was both personal and that was also symptomatic of the entire Victorian civilization, which was suffering from the sense of a loss of faith, which again was propelled by the evolutionary ideas that were in circulation right from the 1830s. Tennyson's In Memoriam grapples with this unprecedented challenge posed by scientific theory, particularly evolution to religious orthodoxy. Part of Tennyson's aim in writing In Memoriam was to assess how this new knowledge of human transience affected himself and his poetic output. Writing in memoriam could have even allowed Tennyson to assess how the very mechanics of his writing, his craft were influenced by his knowledge of evolution. 
The poem is also a deeply philosophical reflection on religion, science, and the promise of immortality. From his earliest manhood, Tennyson breathed the atmosphere of scientific theory and discovery, and throughout his life, meditations were governed by the conceptions of law, processes, development, and evolution, the characteristic ruling ideas of his centuries. It was from geology that Tennyson received the most rude shock. In 1837, he was immersed in Sir Charles Lyell's book, Principles of Geology, and also Robert Chambers, who published his early evolutionary tract, Vestiges of the Natural History of Creation. The main thesis of these books was that the present state of the Earth's crust is to be accounted for not by a series of catastrophic changes, but by the continuous operation through immense tracts of geological time of the natural forces still at work, namely erosion, gradual earth movements and sedimentation. Apparently innocent sounding, these facts rudely shook the biblical chronology of earth's creation and put to doubt, if not negated the notion of divine creation and superintendence. Tennyson lived during a period of such great scientific advancement and he used his poetry to work out the conflict between religious faith and scientific discoveries. These discoveries challenged traditional religious understandings of nature and natural history. He was deeply troubled by the proliferation of scientific knowledge about the origins of life and human progress while he was writing this poem along with his mourning of Hallam's death. He writes in In Memoriam, believing where we cannot prove, he reflects early evolutionary theories in his faith that man, through a process lasting millions of years, is developing into something greater. And here, I would like to digress a little. And this proposition where Tennyson is trying to say that holding unto faith is an anchorage in a godless world, reminds us of another great Victorian poem, Dover Beach by Matthew Arnold which too mourns the Victorian malady of the loss of faith and points out to the barren shingles where once the sea of faith had engirdled the human mind. Arnold too prescribes human love and mutual faith as the panacea for this sterility like Tennyson. In the end, replaces the doctrine of immortality of the soul with the imm immortality of mankind through evolution thereby achieving a synthesis between his profound religious faith and the new scientific ideas of his day. For most of his career, he was deeply interested in and troubled by these discoveries. In Memoriam connects this despair over the loss of his friend Hallam and the despair he felt when contemplating a godless world. It is the knowledge of evolution's ruthlessness which casts doubts on Tennyson's comfort in the immortality of the soul and which challenges the hopeful tone of a traditional elegy since if nature is so careless and again quoting from uh, one of the in memoriam poems careless of the type what hope does the individual life let alone the soul of the departed hallam have in being eternal a look at sonnet 55 poignantly reveals this doubt and anxiety the wish that of the living whole, no life may fail beyond the grave, derives it not from what we have, the likest God within the soul? Our God and nature then at strife, that nature lends such evil dreams, so careful of the type she seems, so careless of the single life, that I, considering everywhere her secret meaning in her deeds, and finding that of fifty seeds, she often brings but one to bear, I falter where I firmly trod, and falling with my weight of cares upon the great world's altar stairs that slope through darkness up to God. I stretch lame hands of faith and grope, and gather dust and chaff, and call to what I feel is Lord of all, and faintly trust the larger hope. The profusion in the natural world appalled Tennyson because he realizes that the profusion is only an effort by nature to keep the type preserved. He hated this because it implies a carelessness towards the individual or towards individual lives 
and his purpose in the poem is to assert the transcendence of the individual soul of Hallam's soul. In the end, however, the poem affirms both religious faith and faith in human progress. Nevertheless, Tennyson continued to struggle with the reconciliation of science and religion as illustrated by some of his later work. Remarkably, however, instead of explicitly denying Hallam's death, and so finding comfort in Hallam's spiritual promotion, all we see in In Memoriam is a constant fluctuating doubt about the soul's immortality. The poem transitions from outright grief in For all is dark where thou art not, the aimlessness of life in Man shall be blown away about the desert dust, to optimism and acceptance in Though mixed with God and nature thou, I seem to love thee more and more. It is to this faith that Tennyson clings on and helps other Victorians and Victorian readers to cling on to this faith which is fast ebbing. Thank you.